commission will come to order. Um, I know that uh, former Chairman Michael Corey is uh, watching, and in his honor, we're going to start on time. Uh, I wouldn't count on an exact on time, though, for the entire length of my chairmanship, but today, anyway, we will. I want to welcome everybody to the Commission's May 2022 uh, meeting. Um, our public session today will cover uh, four items. Uh, then we will probably take a very brief break, followed by a, a closed session. Uh, the Commission will remain actively engaged in addressing issues that are under our jurisdiction, especially as it relates to exports. And I look forward today to hearing from Commissioner Dye on fact, her fact-finding 29 investigation into the effects of the pandemic on the ocean shipping supply chain. I also look forward to hearing from Commissioner Bensel on his container availability report. We will also hear from Dr. Kristen Monaco on part 520 rulemaking and uh, from our managing director, Lucy Marvin, on the continuing vessel operating common carrier audit program. Uh, before that, I do want to note for the first time in quite a while, we are all meeting in person, all five commissioners, all the senior staff, and I'm very, very uh, grateful to everybody who made that possible, a lot of uh, staff, people who worked very hard and, and who anticipated the need for this. So we, obviously we wouldn't have been able to function as optimally as we did during the pandemic if it weren't for making sure that we were prepared. Uh, one of the people who is maybe the most responsible for this is former Chairman Michael A. Corey. Um, and the, his leadership that he showed uh, here at the Commission for many, many years is certainly worth noting and worth honoring. Um, he spent years and years dedicated to the mission of this agency and to making sure that all the stakeholders, uh, especially American uh, shippers and, and uh, transportation intermediaries, were well served. And so on behalf of myself and my fellow commissioners and the commission as a whole, and in recognition of Michael A. Corey's contributions to the missions and objective of the commission, I would like to officially present him today with a citation and gold medal. We actually have it here. Don't worry, we will get it to you, Mike. Uh, and I would also like to present him uh, with uh, this uh, uh, Federal Maritime Commissioner flag. That's right, everybody. The commissioners have their own flag. This isn't a new thing, but here it is. Um, we will make sure uh, that, uh, uh, Mike, as I said, I, I know you can't be here in person, but I know you're watching this meeting. Um, and uh, I hope you know how truly grateful we all are to your service and how I uh, personally am grateful for your friendship and mentorship over the years. And uh, I'm sure that uh, I won't be a perfect chairman, but whatever mistakes I make, I'm sure you will have advised me to do the opposite thing. Uh, and so um, we'll arrange to have these uh, commemorations delivered to you. Um, and uh, also, uh, I do want to just give my colleagues a chance to say a few words if, if they wish. Commissioner Dye. Thank you, Mike. This is bittersweet. I miss you uh, and have personally benefited from your support and your advice uh, during the times that we were together on the commission. And this, this award is very well deserved. Um, I'm sure we all agree. Um, and all the very best because you deserve it. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Benzel. Uh, I don't know if uh, everyone knows, but Mike was a tugboat captain. So he was uh, actually a, a mariner that was uh, involved in the movement of cargo. And, and I'd just like to thank him for being such a gracious uh, chairman. When I came on, um, he was uh, a great leader and very uh, kind, a good person, uh, a, a good commissioner, a good chairman. And we really had a, a lot of uh, challenges with the pandemic. And he really, I think, uh, thought of, of our staff and the safety and the welfare and uh, was a true leader. So uh, thanks, Mike, and, and uh, we miss you. Commissioner Sola. Yeah, thank you uh, very much, Mike, for the mentorship that you gave me and also by having a, a brilliant legal mind on helping me understand a lot of the uh, um, uh, aspects of the Shipping Act, and uh, I'm very grateful. Thanks, Commissioner Sola. Commissioner Beckage. Chair Corey, uh, uh, you and I didn't have the pleasure to serve together, and uh, however, 
your reputation as a fair and just chair of this commission precedes you, and uh, I hope you uh, have a great retirement. And uh, also from the working waterfront myself, uh, I, I know you'll be missed. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Beckett. Um, um, and there's the last thing I'll say is, is that I, I too miss, uh, miss you, Mike, um, and I look forward to seeing you more, of course. Uh, it's a lot easier to get together once your your uh, federally mandated cooling off period, the time that uh, commissioners are not supposed to talk to any of the uh, former commissioners aren't supposed to talk to any of the current commissioners about any particular any um, relevant uh, events uh, for uh, I think it's two years. I don't know. General Counsel can tell me if it's different, but um, but uh, look forward to that time being over with so we can uh, discuss uh, some issues again. Um, uh, in 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 a, in a, a better way, but but uh, congratulations on your retirement, and again, we will get these uh, awards right out to you. Uh, with that, Mr. Secretary, the commission is ready for the first item on the agenda. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Um, the first item on the agenda is Commissioner Die update on fact finding twenty nine international ocean transportation supply chain engagement. Good morning. It's great to be back together. I want to, first of all, thank my colleagues for their trust in me to handle this fact-finding investigation. This is my fourth major investigation, and one could say perhaps it should be the last. But we'll see. The last pandemic-related investigation, I'll agree to that, Commissioner Dunn. But as always, I appreciate your support and advice. As we close fact finding 29, the Commission's investigation of the circumstances involving our U.S. international ocean freight delivery system during the COVID pandemic, we are aware it's not completely over. We're still alert for potential supply chain fallout affecting the already overextended American freight delivery system particularly from the Chinese COVID-19 shutdown decisions. There is a growing evidence that the market peaked during the first quarter of this year. And according to some in industry experts, spot rates are softening. Others say rates are truly dropping. And next year, new ships will enter the market, providing further downward pressure on rates. As always, my most important sources of information during investigations are from major international supply chain actors themselves, exporters, importers, ocean carriers, seaports, marine terminal operators, organized labor, ocean shipping intermediaries, truckers, railroads, and chassis providers, of course, warehouses. So thank you to the hundreds of you who reached out to me and were involved in my speeches, other large meetings, emails, phone conversations, and FMC supply chain innovation team meetings to support Fact Finding 29. Since 2014, my interest has been focused on the complex system of the American international ocean supply chain. Increasing the performance and the resilience of our complex ocean freight delivery system will in turn strengthen our American economy against inevitable global supply and demand shocks. Our complex international ocean transportation supply system is dynamic and competitive. Rather than a chain that only touches at the links, it's actually a complex system in which everything interacts all the time globally. It's a mistake to approach complex systemic problems, especially complex systems that involve human decisions in a market, as though they're simple to solve especially when there are several complex systems interacting continuously, it may be impossible to identify a root cause of systemic locations. 
The Commission has had success with an approach we developed to deal with supply chain challenges we call the FMC Supply Chain Innovation Teams. The teams are not roundtables, advisory committees, or general discussion groups. They're small teams composed of industry leaders that engage on a particular supply chain topic or bottleneck. We do substantial background work to set the table for their discussions and allow the teams to focus and engage on a particular topic. Several of my recommendations will involve the use of FNC innovation teams to give us assurance that we're fully considering issues and concerns from all angles, especially involving seaport operations. There are two major concerns of importers and exporters who spoke to me during my discussions in this fact-finding. Prices and demerge and detention charges. I want to assure our American importers and exporters that the Federal Maritime Commission is doing its job to enforce competition among ocean carriers. There exist misunderstandings about how we enforce competition among ocean carriers and among seaports and marine terminals. And that's on us to correct. We should provide more information on how we enforce the competition laws under the Shipping Act of 1984 as amended to our shipping public. I have a more complete explanation of the competition tools we use to enforce competition under the Shipping Act in my report. The short story is that we use the same tools to analyze our markets as those employed by the Federal Trade Commission and the Department of Justice. There is a statutory division of responsibility between the FMC and the Department of Justice. The Commission handles collaborations among competitors, for example, joint ventures and vessel sharing agreements like alliances. The Department of Justice handles mergers and acquisitions. A list of ocean carrier mergers since 2014 is included in my report. For now, let me clarify these two points. First, concerning our markets for ocean carrier services. Our Trans-Pacific West Coast market for ocean shipping is not concentrated. Our Trans-Atlantic East Coast market is barely con concentrated by generally accepted standards. Ocean carrier alliances have limited operational authority. They price and market separately. Their vessel sharing agreements and only called alliances because they operate globally. They are not mergers. The alliance companies have substantial tonnage outside the alliances, and because our markets are highly contestable, ships chase cargo, new entrants have also entered our markets for ocean shipping. The Commission regularly, regularly consults with our international competition enforcement partners, including the European Union competition officials. We compare our market findings to ensure that there are no problems that we are missing. I spoke earlier this week with EU officials with whom we keep in touch on this point, and we agreed that we have seen no competition concerns in our ocean shipping markets. As my report explained, I'm confident that illegal competition problems did not cause the extreme ocean shipping rates and capacity shortages our exporters and importers have experienced. Rather sudden, sustained demand surge, largely from the United States, overwhelmed the supply of shipping capacity and rates increased to historic highs. 
supply chain congestion inland further exacerbated supply. Ships at anchor and containers loaded on them are not available to carry new loads. Moving containers away from seaports was encouraged to free up paralyzed marine terminals for good reason. But loaded containers do not provide additional capacity for other shippers. The order book for new container vessels is at an all-time high. New builds is, is listed as over 700 new ships. Shipping lines have also invested more than ever in new container equipment. Demerge and detention charges, turning the page, have been a huge part of the economic chaos of the last two years. There exists confusion surrounding the application of the interpretative rules incentive principle and how it differs from an approach that is based upon fault or lack of fault in the, car in the, in the cargo owner. In a complex system with many different fact patterns, it may be advisable to regulate by principle rather than rule to avoid unintended or ineffective regulatory outcomes, especially in this complex environment, we chose to govern demurrage and detention collections by the general incentive principle rather than by inflexible regulatory rules. In this regard, many are familiar with general accounting principles, for example, a very close cousin of this approach. The best reason, in my opinion, is that the rule allows for innovation. I encourage that. We must move forward toward better ways than the current demurrage and detention system to incentivize good behavior. We need to replace this chaotic, ineffective approach. We've recently heard from an ocean carrier who's trying a new approach, and we encourage that. For the first time, the Commission has reorganized our enforcement program with resources dedicated to demurrage and detention compliance. This approach will require the Commission to be proactive with ocean carrier and marine terminals to enforce demurrage and detention compliance with the rule and 41102C of Title 46. Of course, the Commission's Consumer Affairs Office our informal complaints process and our formal complaints process are all available to shippers and ocean shipping intermediaries. I also have commitments from each Alliant Carrier CEO USA to personally participate in a revitalized rapid response program for exporters, much like the original program for exporters that started in 2010. Once again, the interpretative rule is not mere guidance because we are enforcing existing statutory requirements under 41102C of Title 46 and will continue to devote the resources necessary to accomplish industry compliance with the law. I do have a few recommendations, and I'll briefly discuss those. First of all, we will require compliance officers for ocean carriers and seaports and marine terminal operators. These compliance officers should report directly to CEOs and not to the general counsel or reside in the general counsel's office. We, I recommend that we establish coherent processes for ocean carriers and marine terminal operators on in two areas, empty container return and earliest return date. Most of you have heard me say that the problems we have experienced during the pandemic are not new. And these are two poster children for that assertion. Uh, we've held innovative innovation team discussions on these two areas. 
and I believe that we're ready to move forward. To increase clarity in the supply chain, we will also issue a rule that defines merchant haulage and ocean carrier haulage. I recommend a national seaport and international ocean carrier advisory committee, especially to work directly with our new national shipper advisory committee. I'd also recommend an investigation of charges that are assessed, assessed through tariffs under the, shipping, under the Shipping Act of 1984 as amended. I heard many complaints about the multitude and the variety of new charges assessed by carriers and marine terminals during the pandemic. And I would like to see the commission have more tools rather than our very limited authority to analyze these new charges. A full-time FMC International Ocean Supply Chain Program with dedicated resources, the very best thing. We should work more closely through our new export expert with the agency most experienced in promoting agricultural exports, the Department of Agriculture, on ways we can improve the agricultural exporter international supply chain. I recommend an FMC outreach initiative to provide more information to the shipping public about our FMC competition program, service contracts, shipper associations and forecasting, among other topics. I also recommend a revival of the rapid response team program, as I just discussed. Innovation teams, engagement concerning blank sailings coordination and other matters reinvigorating the FMC focus on the extreme equipment dislocations at the Memphis Rail Heads and other rail facilities, particularly Chicago and other facilities around the country. This week marks four years since I visited this exceptionally well-qualified group and for, in Memphis and formed an innovation team to discuss their problems. And I would like to assure all of them who may be listening today that I intend to look to your needs next. Finally, I want to commend those in our industry who kept working to deliver cargo in the chaotic, deadly pandemic including seaport and marine terminal personnel, longshore labor, and truckers, among others. Thank you for your help and support, as always. Thank you, Commissioner Dye. And as we uh, approach uh, um, National Maritime Day, we're certainly going to be having those people um, in, our, in our minds and in our hearts. Um, uh, I want to uh, thank you for your continued leadership on this issue. Um, I, uh, I know you've had uh, hundreds of conversations with the industry and the public over the course of this investigation. Um, I also know that this investigation really, I mean, in terms of you having much of a break, you really haven't because before this you were working on Fact Finding 28. Um, and it basically one, one went straight into the other uh, as it turns out. Uh, so um, while I will not... Um, uh, associate myself with your remarks about maybe not doing one of these again, as you certainly deserve a bit of a break. Um, but uh, you were able to pivot gracefully, as gracefully as possible, to looking at the challenges of the COVID uh, pandemic uh, and the various supply chain issues uh, that evolved. Your leadership in this area has truly been a credit to the Commission. In, rec in recognition of your hard work, I do intend uh, to ask you, uh, Commissioner Dye, to uh, work closely with the secretary uh, to uh, put out a, no a notation um, for the commission to vote on the recommendations of your report um, in, in an expedited manner in the next uh, uh, 
few, I'll give you I'll give you to early next. I think I told you in my office, to, you know, by the end of the week. But we'll give us to early next yes, week. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. So I, I really appreciate that. I do want to yield now to my colleagues for uh, questions and comments. Commissioner Benzel. Um, no, no real uh, questions, but uh, uh, thank you for the work that you've done on this. It's critical. Um, it's a, a huge uh, work product. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to look closer at the recommendations, uh, and uh, uh, in particular, I'm very enthusiastic about a, a new uh, advisory uh, committee. I think the ship advisory committee is uh, making a lot of progress. Uh, clearly, we need to, to do something with uh, marine terminal operators and the ocean carriers uh, going forward. There's a lot of discussion that they could have that would benefit the, the, the industry, the shipping industry. So uh, great work. Uh, I'm looking forward to the, the final uh, product, uh, the report itself, and, uh, and looking closely at those recommendations. Thank you, as always. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Benzel. Commissioner Sola. Yes, um, I've had a chance to, to read through the report just for the first time, and it's a Herculean effort that we have here, and it outlines a lot of the uh, uh, supply chain challenges that we've had with uh, some very interesting recommendations. Um, and I'd like to say that I, I found it very unbiased and also very clear on what these issues are and how they could be addressed. And I look forward to the notation and also the uh, vote that will be coming up from the secretary. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Sola. Commissioner Beckett. I think Herculean was an uh, appropriate uh, uh, word. And uh, I want to compliment Commissioner Dye on her excellent work and her thoroughness. And uh, I think if we're trying to figure out every possible way and use all of our tools that we have in existence, um, this looks like building a, you know, I won't say building a better mousetrap because there's sure a lot of vendors out there right now that are trying to sell those kind of concepts. But this is really nuts and bolts. And this is the tools we have to deal with currently. And, and I think uh, making sure we're using those tools effectively as um, uh, warrants a thorough review and, um, and coopering up uh, weak, part, weak spots. And uh, I, for one, um, um, coming from uh, the real world of, uh, of moving cargo, see a lot of these uh, ideas as aiding in that task and um, look forward to working uh, further on um, implementing some of these ideas um, with the commission and continue to work with uh, Commissioner Dye. I also want to thank her for mentioning the um, efforts of uh, workers in the supply chain who have done so much to keep moving cargo and uh, have been unsung heroes. And uh, maybe down the road we should give them medals too. Uh, and I think that would be appropriate. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I agree. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Beckett. I would associate myself with your remarks. I'm not, maybe not medals, but at least some sort of a memorial or some sort of recognition. I think of our uh, port workers um, through this pandemic would would be a very good idea. Uh, Commissioner Dye, again, want to thank you for this. Uh, I guess, um, well, and, and I know uh, it was a Herculean uh, effort. Um, I know several members of our staff helped you greatly. I mean, of course, your counsel, John Moran, and uh, several people, um, uh, Ben Nash and Joel Graham in the Office of General Counsel and Kristen Monaco and her team. But but really, your leadership has been uh, tremendous on this uh, throughout the pandemic. I guess the only question I would ask you is, uh, is there anything, and it, it's a bit of an interview, interview kind of question, but is there anything that surprised you the most or anything that, you know, that, that you really want to emphasize uh, you know, right now, and, and, and then, of course, we'll all, we'll all read the report uh, very thoroughly. I, I want to say I, I neglected to mention um, I, I agree completely with uh, Commissioner Vekic's, um recommendation that we further recognize 
um, all, all of all of our industry um, who is who were out there working while I was in my 750 square foot condo uh, getting <laughs> desperately more and more concerned um, about all of the uh, desperation I heard um, in the in the phone calls um, but but I knew I knew they were working um, and doing their best to work through these problems. I also I I, I forgot to mention the um, the 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 uh, container ship crews um, who were working desperately with IMO um, uh, to get the crews off the ship, and I think that we all we all read those stories, and some of them were <laughs> were stranded. Um, and um, so, uh, so, so they too, they too, uh, and our ocean carriers kept uh, working and delivering. Did, well, oh, on the interview question. Well, yeah. Well, no, it's oh, up to you. It's up did to anything you. surprise me? Um, I've been in Washington for a long time. Mr. Bensel and I were together for so um, although some I, I, I um, some things that have happened are um, interesting but um, no I think those don't surprise me either so if that answers your interview question I'm pleased it does it does thank you again Commissioner Dye and as I say we'll be uh, continuing our efforts on this, and actually, in a strange way, uh, the lessening of your work is uh, is the assignment to the rest of us. I think, in terms of taking action now based on your recommendations. So again, I thank you very much. Um, nothing further for me. So without further objection, we'll move to the next item, and the secretary will introduce it. Thank you. The second item on the agenda is Commissioner Bensel. Assessment of the People's Republic of China's control of container and intermodal chassis manufacturing. Um, <clears throat> this is a uh, long overdue. The chairman would often ask me, "Where are we in this uh, report process?" And I'd say, "We're still working on it." And actually, uh, it started as a result of discussions that I was having with uh, Commissioner Dai about uh, the, the availability of containers, and uh, she was looking at it in the context of Fact Finding Twenty Nine. And, uh, and the return of containers uh, to the terminals in the West Coast uh, at the time. And uh, I, I was hearing reports of, of, uh, of inadequate supplies of containers. And so I, uh, I talked to the chairman and, and, uh, and we uh, agreed to sort of uh, uh, do a report uh, that we would report to the commission on the market for the manufacturing of uh, containers and intermodal chassis. And, uh, I would say it was a wake-up call. It was a, a concerning uh, moment that I think uh, I'm happy to report because I think it's a critical uh, issue that we need to consider. Uh, perhaps it's not an issue that the FMC itself will consider because it's such a large uh, macro issue confronting our country. But, uh, but essentially, we have a complete uh, market dominance in the manufacturer of uh, uh, containers in favor of uh, uh, five major uh, container manufacturing companies located in uh, China. Uh, they're uh, government controlled, and so essentially we have a 100% monopoly in favor of the Chinese government and the uh, use of containers that are serving our, our ports and our people. Um, there's 44.2 million. TEUs used in, 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 in the foreign commerce. Um, uh, 40 million of them are dry freight. Uh, 3.2 million are reefer containers, and we've got some petroleum uh, 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 containers as well. Um, the, uh, uh, the 8 million of these are regional containers, so they're containers that are used uh, in uh, small markets that are sort of unique, and uh, those are, are excluded from from uh, assessment of commerce, but the rest of these containers, other than those re regional containers, are manufactured by five companies in China. Um, three of them uh, are also uh, been the subject of uh, investigations by the U.S. government in terms of uh, subsidy pricing. 
Um, uh, but uh, uh, the evidence uh, is that uh, prior to the pandemic in 2019, uh, through an industry association, um, CCIA, which they are all uh, uh, members of, uh, they took uh, an, uh, made an agreement to um, reduce the availability of containers. It was cost recovery programs, they call it, essentially slowing uh, the production and the manufacturing of containers. Uh, this happened uh, right in, in advance of the pandemic and then was was established um, uh, 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 during the pandemic, there was additional issues on manufacturing. And so we had a, a period of time when there was a reduction of container manufacturing and then a, re, uh, a cessation of production of containers. And those two elements uh, had a uh, impact on, on what happened uh, during the pandemic. Uh, and it was uh, a culmination of a number of issues, uh, the congestion, uh, the uh, pr uh, ch problem we had providing chassis for an incredible surge of cargo uh, that occurred during the pandemic. Carl, I think you can go to the next one. Um, prior to the, the uh, issue of, of the pandemic, uh, uh, the Department of Commerce had done, done a couple of assessments of the market conditions uh, facing both uh, uh, intermodal chassis and containers. Uh, in 2015, they'd assessed the market for 53-foot containers in use in the United States. Uh, interestingly, when I said that every single container is uh, manufactured in China, uh, this includes all of the intermodal trucking and railroad containers that we use. Uh, the assessment essentially uh, concluded that there was substantial subsidies, uh, over 250% subsidies, subsidies provided by the uh, Chinese government, that the companies that manufactured these were state-owned enterprises. Um, uh, there was a web of uh, interlocking ownership uh, through SASIC, which is a, a state-owned and asset control uh, a company that manages a lot of essential services in, in, uh, in, in China, and uh, that, uh, uh, that they couldn't do anything. They couldn't do anything because the containers uh, manufacturing industry was no longer in existence in the United States. Uh, interestingly enough, the United States was uh, the nation that developed intermodal shipping, uh, Malcolm McLean and, and Sealand Service, and so we were the primary producers of containers uh, through the 70s. And then it went to uh, Japan as the, ma as the major manufacturer, uh, Korea and China. And by the 80s, uh, the Chinese manufacturers were manufacturing all the containers. Um, essentially, this mar market dominance precludes other, uh, other companies from entering the market. And as I said, it had an impact uh, during the pandemic uh, as they made a decision uh, as a group uh, uh, to slow production. And uh, the end result, I think you can skip ahead uh, to the next one, Carl, uh, was that, uh, was that uh, we saw an increase in pricing uh, for containers, uh, essentially uh, tripled in value uh, in terms of the cost. And uh, there was uh, challenges, uh, and they weren't just uh, on the price of the container itself. Uh, because it was uh, the availability of containers, and it was convoluted in that um, that you had problems getting containers back to China uh, because of congestion. So those two elements, uh, in addition to uh, challenges that we had with uh, uh, intermodal equipment, uh, chassis, chassis availability, and so they all compounded the challenges that we had as a nation facing uh, pandemic uh, increases of cargo. And so uh, in the 2019 timeframe, Department of Commerce and ITC did an investigation of the intermodal chassis market. And the same companies are involved. Uh, and the dominance there is a little less. Uh, I, I think 86% of the market is controlled by the Chinese government uh, on the manufacture of intermodal chassis. There's some chassis that are built in Mexico and some in the United States. And in this case, they also concluded that the subsidies were there, that they were a state-controlled uh, asset, um, and that 
uh, and that in this case, they had a market uh, for the manufacturing of intermodal chassis and they imposed um, discipline uh, tariffs on the uh, import of Chinese uh, intermodal equipment uh, chassis. In this case, it was uh, problematic, challenging, I'd say. Uh, uh, and it was challenging because we were running out of equipment and we we're having problems handling the, the port volumes that we had. Uh, but but uh, but there is evidence now that there is a developing market for the manufacture of domestic uh, intermodal chassis in the United States. And so uh, there's always a challenge when you try to balance uh, uh, market uh, uh, distortions through competition. And uh, and so the, in this case, it was a, it was a challenge. But it seems that there are some uh, positive steps uh, that are being taken uh, to uh, introduce intermodal chassis uh, from the United States, uh, but we're still at 100% dominance uh, in, in, the mar in the market for uh, container shipping uh, and containers itself. Uh, it is an issue of concern to me personally, and the reason I wrote this report is I think we should all think about what that means uh, uh, from a macro perspective. Uh, we took actions in Russia. Uh, to restrict uh, uh, trade, to take trade actions uh, when they, uh, when they uh, uh, attacked the Ukraine. Uh, I question whether because of our reliance on containers that we could take the same sort of actions to China. And is this a critical piece of equipment, an essential piece of equipment that we need to pay more attention to? There are some efforts in the United States now to look at next generation of technology, uh, smart containers, uh, uh, different uh, types of, uh, of uh, steel and composite. Uh, and so uh, uh, Senator Collins uh, from Maine has been working on that through uh, a couple of universities. Uh, there's some issues uh, uh, related to uh, manufacturing where foreign governments now are looking at the same issue and they've taken steps to induce uh, competition, uh, South Korea in particular, India. And there are issues related not to the trade from China to the U.S., because the Chinese clearly want to, send, to continue to send, sell uh, their products into the United States. So I, I feel that there's some mitigating impacts in, the, uh, in this uh, monopoly. Uh, that help us get our cargo from China, but they're not necessarily applicable to the market from uh, other uh, locations, uh, South Korea, Japan, uh, European markets. So we really need to take a, a look at that. The end result in terms of the actions of the uh, Chinese uh, container manufacturing industry was that in December 2021, the Chinese government announced that they were taking steps to uh, encourage the industry uh, to ramp up production, and they did. Uh, they, uh, they doubled uh, their output, and at the end of last year, we basically had a record year in terms of the manufacture of containers. But the question is, uh, that decision early on prior to the pandemic, what did that mean to our economy, and what does it mean uh, to be com continually reliant on it? And so. Um, there are a few things that we can do. It's a, ch it's a huge challenge because this is a macro issue, perhaps bigger than the FMC. Uh, but uh, uh, but uh, the Department of Commerce, uh, ITC, have, have sort of taken their shot at it. Uh, I don't know if they can do anything further. The Department of Justice has uh, control over monopolies. I don't think that they've looked at this issue. And of course, the uh, Federal uh, Maritime Commission has the Foreign Shipping Practices Act. And at first blush, um, it, it appears that our statute could be applicable uh, to trade uh, uh, remedies in this area. Um, but I'm not going to pine on that much more. But I did want to uh, bring this to the attention of the public. I'm uh, having meetings with people on Capitol Hill, other agencies, anyone who's interested, because I think it's something that we need to think about. Uh, that reliance. Uh, you, you don't see a 100% uh, monopoly 
over a, an essential piece of equipment in the world uh, and, and, and not t uh, take notice. So um, with that, I also wanted to thank staff. I, I had a lot of people who volunteered their time, uh, uh, Steve and, and uh, uh, Mary and folks who reviewed it, John uh, DeCosta, uh, thank you for taking the time to help me uh, make sure it was accurate and uh, I appreciate that. I hope I didn't miss anyone. But with that, I'm, I'm uh, happy to take questions. Uh, oh, Kristen as well. Kristen, thank you. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, but uh, it, was, uh, it was good work product. I want to thank my uh, counsel, John Young, for all the work we did. We, we met with uh, all, every carrier that we could, every uh, uh, container leaser, uh, uh, chassis uh, manufacturer, and shippers, uh, ports, uh, terminals. Uh, and they all had concerns about this, uh, and they wanted to keep those concerns quiet. So, with that, thank you very, uh, there, thank you very much, Commissioner Benzel, for all your uh, hard work on this. Um, let me, uh, you know, let me yield to my colleagues for questions first, and then I'll have one or two. Uh, Commissioner Dye. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I am, uh, obviously, have been involved um, in. Um, container supply, and I appreciate this. Uh, you know, if we're going to start thanking people, I see a bunch of people out there that I need to say. Thanks to uh, nearly everybody touched my report. Ben Shed's our webinar star, uh, and he's helped me um, st stood in Joel Graham's shoes. And, I, and, those, are, and those are tough to fill. Um, so um, uh, all of you. Uh, and obviously Kristen, uh, who have helped me, um, and John Moran. I appreciate it so much. Thank you. Now, have, have any of these issues come before the International Trade Commission? Your, your, um, your authorities are thorough. It has not. It's really only come to the Department of Commerce in, in 2015, and they haven't looked at it in the GATT context that I'm aware of. Uh, it have to be uh, covered, of course, under the GATT. Uh, so it, it's, a, it, it's a potential area I didn't list, uh, but, uh, but uh, I, you know, it's, it has not been assessed as, mm -hmm. a, as a trade okay. issue. All right. But thank you very much for this. Thank you, Commissioner Dye. Uh, Commissioner Sola. Thank you, Commissioner Benzel, for this uh, uh, very extensive report and for your uh, uh, passion and uh, intellect into looking at possible problems in the future. Um, I believe it's in every nation's interest to ensure that they have proper equipment for exports. And uh, as we can see that China is a major exporter, that they are definitely embracing that role. Um, on some of the, the findings, I believe that uh, I've been contacted by a company in Wisconsin and one in Indiana, and also some in, uh, I believe it was Mexico, that, that I can think of off the top of my head. And um, I, I believe it's up to, uh, I, I don't know what exact um, uh, statute or regulation that we would have in the FMC uh, to, pro to promote this, but we could definitely use our contacts on the Hill and promote more being done here nationally and also nearshoring. And I look forward to having some more discussions with you on how we can be helpful. Uh, thanks, Commissioner Sola. It's a uh, it's um, it's a uh, it's a big potential issue, um, and and so far it's worked out in our favor. Um, but uh, but I think it's important to to have everyone know what's what's at stake potentially. Thank you, Commissioner Sola. Commissioner Beckage. I want to compliment you, Commissioner Bensol, on your hard work here and your, uh, um, your one-man uh, quest uh, to get some answers. Uh, on the Pacific Coast, uh, Chinese uh, competition on every level is becoming more and more obvious uh, to those of us who have worked out there and are from there, and, uh, and it goes um, at, at, at shipping, containers, the Navy, uh, sea power, force projection, 
it's all China is uh, emerging as a uh, you know they they have a quest of their own and um, it looks to me to be number one um, at our expense perhaps so you know this is timely Commissioner Benzel and um, I am uh, happy to assist you in this uh, examination and uh, it, it, it's been a um, it was a bad it was a bad theory to try to offshore uh, American manufacturing and jobs uh, elsewhere uh, when this country was on top and um, uh, and I think uh, it's not too late hopefully not too late to uh, bring some of that manufacturing home and to to take care of uh, producing vital services and vital tools and containers certainly have become a vital tool thank you well, uh, thank you, C Commissioner Vekic. Uh, I agree uh, completely. It's a, a, ch a challenge to rely completely on uh, on one nation. Uh, I think statistically, I was looking at it, 43% um, of the world's fleet is built in China. 100% uh, uh, of all the marine containers used in intermodal shipping. 86% uh, of all the cha uh, chassis. And I, I, I'm not going to be specific on the ocean a container carriage, but the two uh, Chinese uh, uh, controlled carriers are well above 20% in that market. So there's a, there is a, a, a definite power there, and it's an intentional uh, effort on, on part of their controlled carrier uh, as defined in our statute. So, so we just have to, to be aware and, and, to, and to pay attention to it. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Beckage. Um, Commissioner Benzel, again, thank you very much for the report. I did tease you a little bit about uh, how long it took to do, but you've got a lot on your plate with the uh, data initiative, et cetera. So, uh, so, so, so I was uh, certainly willing to give you extensions to the extent I could. I, uh, some of the people waiting for the report on Capitol Hill may have been a little bit less patient. But um, I do have one question, which is, did, did you learn anything about the uh, manufacturing of different kinds of containers. For instance, uh, 20 foot versus 40 foot. Uh, as you know, our, our exporters use more of the 20s because the, they ship agricultural goods, which tend to be heavier um, and largely prefer 20s. Obviously, uh, you know, the um, manufactured uh, consumer goods from China t tend to use more 40s. So wondering if you saw a differentiation there and if part of the issue is just that we're not manufacturing enough. We as a world, the Chinese are not, are not manufacturing enough 20s. You know, it wasn't really in the 20 to 40 uh, area, but it was in the reefer market. So the reefer market has a lot of equipment, and that is built in other places. I think uh, uh, Maersk was involved uh, in uh, in reefer uh, production, uh, and then they, they got out recently. So so we're, we're back uh, to 100%. But there was some distinctions, and there, there was a lot more equipment and components. Really, the container has not changed much since we've... Uh, we, we've uh, Established it in the early uh, uh, late fifties. Still, you know, still six sides. Six sides. Six sides. And then boxed steel right. and corrugated, and they're really not very high tech. Uh, we probably should be looking at ways that you could uh, be able to track cargo to have uh, it last longer and 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 get away from uh, technology that was developed uh, fifty years ago, seventy years ago, sixty years ago. Let me yield to Commissioner Dye. I, 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 I would say on that point about. Um, the, the sides and the, the the container that we've talked to an a, a, a company um, uh, with uh, who wants to manufacture in the United States with um, the uh, accordion like containers and um, always on the lookout for some uh, for some new new innovative thing. Um, we've gotten to know him a little bit, and we look forward to his success. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Dunn. Yeah. I think I'm good. Okay, so. I, I, do have, I do have one comment, which is um, it, it be this, very good work here. I, I think, one, um, you know, we, China is a very different kind of country, very different kind of economy uh, and government structure. Th that said, we do have a pretty good uh, relationship with our uh, Chinese counterparts. Um, and at the, our meeting last, uh, last September, we did bring this issue up and we were able to talk to them. And they did, did assure us that they were 
uh, they were trying to have more containers actually built too for, for the Chinese government's own purposes. And in fact, you do point that out on page 21, that the Chinese carrier ca container manufacturers did ramp up production substantially in 2021. So the news isn't all bad, but uh, clearly we have left ourselves vulnerable. And I think this is the, the, the real point I want to make is, is uh, somebody tuning into this might sort of see this as, okay, we're, we're saying, you know, China's to blame here. Um, look, certainly the policies of the People's Republic of China and their industries, the subsidizing of container manufacturers, which does undercut competition both in other Asian countries and in uh, North America and Europe, is, is clearly an issue. Uh, but the fact is, is that I, I don't, reading this report, I, I don't see us, you're, we're not really blaming China so much as the U.S. policies and lack thereof that, that have allowed us to have this kind of vulnerability. Um, and, and I think that's where it really needs to be addressed. Um, you know, China is filling a void, essentially, again, you know, per, perhaps partly caused by them, by these subsidies, but even when we talk about U.S. action on the subsidies, we, we don't see much. So, um, you know, your comment on page four uh, that, uh, the global supply chain is too interdependent not to have broad access and manufacturing capabilities for international operational equipment. The U.S. should uh, assess whether, given market dominance, that further trade action be contemplated and whether to invest more aggressively in the next generation of container manufacturing technology. So, you know, at the end of the day, uh, this is a very good assessment of what's going on in the People's Republic of China, but it is not a China bashing report. This is a report to draw our attention uh, as a country and as an industry and as a government to this issue. And, and we don't need to be vulnerable on this, but yet we are. So for all of that, uh, I applaud this report and I applaud you for your work in it, uh, Commissioner Benzel. And uh, again, uh, you know, thank you for, for, for getting, it, getting it done. Uh, I, well said, I agree, so. Okay. Well, nothing further from me. Without objection, uh, we'll now move to the next item, Mr. Secretary. The third item on the agenda is a staff briefing on carrier automated tariffs. This item will be presented by Kristen Monac I'm sorry, will be presented by Susan Johnson of the Office of Bureau of Trade Analysis. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Commissioners. On May 10, 2022, a notice of proposed rulemaking was published in the Federal Register sinking comments on proposed changes to 46 CFR Part 520, Carrier Automated Tariffs. The proposed rule seeks to increase transparency and consistency for shippers by updating regulations to reflect current technology and addressing industry practices that have evolved over time. The proposed changes address regulations regarding public tariff access, charges passed through from a vessel operating common carrier or third party to a non-vessel operating common carrier, and co-loading and other common carrier practices. This proposed rulemaking follows the issuance of an advanced notice of proposed rulemaking on April 7, 2021. Comments received in the ANPRM were considered in developing the proposed rules that would apply to tariff access and pass-through charges. A proposed rule outlined in the NPRM would require common carriers to provide free access to their tariff systems. Since the enact enactment of the Ocean Shipping Reform Act of 1998, common carrier and conference tariffs are no longer filed with the Commission, but are instead required to be published in carrier automated tariff systems. Tariffs showing all rates, charges, classifications, rules, and practices must be kept open for public inspection and made available to any person without time, quantity, or other limitations. The Act and implementing Commission regulations currently allow common carriers and conferences to charge a reasonable fee to the public for access to their tariff publication systems. Advances in technology since the time this regulation was written have made it nearly essential for businesses to operate a free, publicly accessible website. Decreases in the cost of providing information online and the efficiency of providing access through a website have made it reasonable to now require that a common carrier provide tariff access free of charge. 
In fact, many carriers, including seven of the top 10 ocean common carriers, already provide free access to their tariffs. However, staff research, as well as comments in response to the ANPRM, reveal that a limited number of carriers charge fees so high as to effectively prevent unlimited access, contrary to the intent of the Ocean Shipping Reform Act. The proposed rule would remove the carrier's option to charge a fee for access to their tariff, thereby removing any cost barriers to the public for tariff access. The NPRM also proposes regulations that apply to charges assessed by a vessel operating common carrier, or VOCC, to a non-vessel operating common carrier, or NVOCC. Currently, an NVOCC has broad flexibility to, to pass through an increase in a VOCC charge to its shipper when using negotiated service arrangements or negotiated rate arrangements under parts 531 and 532 of commission regulations. However, an NVOCC has no such flexibility when applying tariff rates under Part 520. As with any tariff rate, increases in VOCC-originated surcharges and accessorials must be published in the Ocean Common Carrier's tariff 30 days prior to taking effect. However, despite advance notice of an increase published in a VOCC tariff, NVOCCs comment and commented in response to the ANPRM that in the current environment of high demand for vessel capacity, the number of new charges and frequent increases to existing charges make it impracticable for NVOCCs to provide same-day notice of those charges in their own tariffs. The proposed rule would simplify the notice requirement by allowing an NVOCC to cross-reference a VOCC's tariff for certain specified charges, provided the name charges are clearly listed in the NVOCC's tariff and charged to its customer without markup. The proposed rule allows for greater transparency in identifying the source of certain fees and accessorials, which in turn fosters a more competitive ocean transportation marketplace. In addition to charges that ori originate with the VOCC, NVOCCs are periodically assessed charges which are passed through after being imposed on the VOCC by an outside entity, such as canal tolls, taxes, or other third-party levies over which the VOCC has no control. Current regulations do not explicitly allow NVOCCs to pass through increases which are imposed by an outside entity and then subsequently pass through by a VOCC without the required 30-day notice. To establish consistency among common carriers in the application of these charges, the NPRM proposes to revise the current regulations to state explicitly that NVOCCs can pass through these third-party charges in the same manner as VOCCs. The NPRM also updates regulations which apply to the co-loading of cargo and other arrangements routinely practiced among NVOCCs in order to facilitate transparency and protect the underlying shipper throughout any process which involves multiple NVOCCs. A common arrangement among NVOCCs is to combine less than container loads of cargo received from their respective customers in containers moving between common ports of load and discharge, a practice known as co-loading. Commission regulations that apply to co-loaded cargo require that the bill of lading is annotated with the name of any other NVOCC to which the shipment has been tendered for co-loading. The annotation requirement ensures that the underlying shipper has a means of contact to determine the location and status of its cargo in the event of intervening acts which prevent the timely delivery of cargo. Over time, NVOCCs have increasingly entered into arrangements with one another involving the tendering of full container loads from one NVOCC to another. NVOCCs often cooperate in the movement of full container loads of cargo when one of the NVOCCs is in a position to pro provide more favorable rates and or services in a particular trade lane. Despite the fact that these arrangements do not include the consolidation of less than container load shipments, the industry nonetheless also refers to this practice as co-loading. In these cases, the NVOCC with which a shipper has contracted will tender their container to another NVOCC to perform the ocean transportation. As with less than container load cargo, it is essential that the underlying shipper be aware that its cargo is in the custody and control of a third party NVOCC. The proposed rule therefore places the same requirement for annotation on containerized cargo that applies to less than container loads of cargo. This requirement ensures that should the tendering NVOCC fail to uphold its obligations to the shipper, the shipper is able to contact the NV NVOCC in possession of its cargo 
to prevent the risk of delay in cargo release at destination and the accumulation of additional charges. This concludes the Part 520 presentation. I will happy to address any questions you may have. Great. Uh, thank you very much, um, Ms. Johnson. Um, I'll now go to my colleagues to see if they have any comments and questions. Commissioner Dye. Thank you very much for that. I, I would like to talk with you more uh, after um, about this co-loading issue. Um, for, for us, it may be um, one of the more overlooked issues um, before us, but um, for, for those in the industry, um, it isn't. And I, I need to understand uh, this rule better. Um, and so I look forward to talking with you on that. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Dye. Commissioner Benzel. Um, yeah, I, th I think this is important to, to get a grasp on who's shipping what uh, commodities and who's really doing the, the uh, has legal obligations uh, uh, and, and who's doing shipping. I will tell you, I had a meetings with uh, C uh, CBP recently, and uh, uh, this is uh, the co-loading deals with NVOCCs to NVOCCs. But uh, they were telling me of a, a cargo container that they opened uh, shipped by an NVOCC, you probably can guess, just by me, that had uh, uh, 10,000 bills of lading in it. Stunning amount of co-loading. It's not co-loading because it's not NVOCC to NVOCC. But I guess my question is, is uh, you can always structure something a little bit differently. And so can the NVOCC avoid NVOCC uh, co-loading requirements by just having an NVOCC and, and, and shipper uh, relationship? Uh, uh, the, the intent in the uh, co-loading situation with 10,000 bills of lading is to avoid paying customs duties. So if you have a whole bunch of shippers using the same container, um, there's a de minimis requirement in the customs uh, uh, amount. So that, that container comes in with all of these different shipments uh, that stay underneath that amount. But it, do, it, it it's something that we need to consider within the context of NVOCC co-loading re requirements. But uh, this is a, sl a slippery area, I agree, with uh, Commissioner Dye. Thank you, Commissioner Benzel. Commissioner Sola. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. A, a couple of comments, and then I actually have a question. Um, I was on the road uh, the other day, and I drove by one of those great big truck stops, and they have the prices out front. And as I was driving by, the prices kept changing. It looked like a slot machine or something like that. And I realized that we have some extraordinary times where the prices have been increasing, and now they're starting to soften and hopefully come back down. Um, so I'm, I, I fully uh, support when you know you go to your bank and you go to get a loan. They have LIBOR or Prime Plus. So I understand, I understand that very well. Uh, my question would be: is it, it needs to be fully disclosed and accessible? And and also, I mean, do we have a common cookie cutter format that we could? provide or suggest, or has that been considered? Uh, we've developed some guidance uh, as to um, co-loading practices that we see commonly. No, among... Not co-loading on, on the prices. Oh, I'm uh, on sorry. On the tariffs. Um, oh, I, I'm sorry. I, I misunderstood. Um, uh, tariff, tariff publishers, of course, are there to provide a service to the carriers, um, and they will charge for that service. There are a, about a dozen uh, that uh, do compete in one another for, for service, so they have different packages that they offer. Um, so uh, as far as the prices that, that they charge the carriers for to, to tariff their pub, to publish their tariff, um, that is something um, I don't have explicit knowledge of. Um, they, they do. No, my point was more to all the information would be fully disclosed. If they were going, uh, if an NVOCC was was pulling information from somewhere else, okay, um, an NVOCC has uh, has some options uh, as to what they charge their their shipper. Whether some are public, 
uh, if they choose to publish in a tariff, they also have the option to engage in um, individual agreements with directly with their shipper. So under a negotiated rate arrangement or a negotiated service arrangement, those uh, terms and conditions between shipper and NVOCC would, would not be disclosed. So those prices would not be available to, to the commission or to the public. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Betzel. I'm sorry, thank you, Commissioner Sola. Commissioner Beckage. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have uh, no questions uh, at this time. Thank you, Commissioner Beckage. Um, I only have uh, one question. Not surprisingly, it's going to be on co-loading. I was just at the, uh, uh, recently, I guess, a, week, a couple weeks ago, at the NCB FAA um, annual meeting in uh, Tucson, Arizona. And of course, uh, that's the, the big group of freight forwarders, custom brokers, and uh, ocean transportation intermediaries. And, and they think uh, that we're rather obsessed with co-loading. Um, but why is it not uh, straightforward? Why are there so many... Okay, but why is the definition of, of this of this uh, practice so difficult to, to, to pin down, or at least in need of pinning down with this uh, with this uh, regulation? Yes, sir. Um, I think that different practices have evolved um, over time um, for for various reasons. Um, I think uh, the the commission has been interested in the transparency of these arrangements. Um, the NVOCCs have options uh, with their customers and with each other. And we have concentrated on making the shipper aware of who has their cargo. I think that's, you know, that has been where the, the emphasis has been uh, for us. Great, actually, and I do think that actually addresses Commissioner uh, Bensel's concern with uh, so many bills of lading. It's, it's not so much how many bills of lading are in a container. It's, it's, it's as long as the transparency is there so that each shipper uh, understands that. But um, like Commissioner Dye, I'll, I'll want to have more discussions with this offline just to make sure that we all understand it appropriately. Um, have we received any responses uh, to the NPRM so far in the comment period? Uh, we have not to the NPRM. However, the response to the ANPRM is uh, we took into consideration for our um, proposed regulations on tariff access and pass-through charges. Did the NCB FAA respond to the ANPRM? Yes. Okay. Um, I would note that uh, the comment period goes until June 9th, so there's still, there's still time, but we definitely want to hear from anybody who has uh, an interest, any stakeholders who have an interest in this. Um, anything else from my colleagues on this one? No. Well, thank you again, um, Ms. Johnson and, and uh, Ms. Uh, Dr. Dr. Monaco. Um, and uh, with that, uh, without objection, we'll go to the next and final item for the open session, uh, Mr. Secretary. The fourth item on your agenda today is a staff update on Vessel Operating Common Carrier Audit Program. I note that this discussion will continue in the closed session. This item will be presented by Lucille Marvin, Managing Director. I would note that um, some of this discussion will involve, uh, potentially could involve proprietary information, which we're not allowed to discuss in public session, which is why some of it will be in the closed session. But definitely wanted some of it in the open session as well. So thank you, uh, Ms. Marvin. Uh, you, might, you may proceed. Can you hear me okay? Everybody can hear me? Okay, great. All right. Good morning, Chairman Maffei, Commissioners Dai, Bensel, Sola, and Beckage. I appreciate the opportunity to update you today on the VOCC audit program, uh, program's activities. Since the last update in January, the team was charged with meeting with carriers to discuss exports. For today's presentation, I'll start with a discussion of activities related to detention and demerge charges and then I'll talk about exports. Next slide, please. And with that, our detention and demerge update. Next slide, please, Carl. When the VOCC audit program started 10 months ago, I was charged with evaluating detention and demerge practices of the nine largest carriers by market share. For a review, those are CMA, CGM, Costco, Hapag Lloyd, HMM, Evergreen, Maersk, O&E, 
MSC, and Yangming. When we first reached out to the carriers, we asked about their external facing policies related to detention and demurrage, as well as their internal policies and practices. I made it clear that external documentation is necessary for transportation, I'm sorry, for, for transparency of information to their customers, and internal documentation lessens the likelihood that policies are not carried out in ad hoc ways. I'm pleased to say that all carriers now have much more comprehensive public-facing information concerning detention and demurrage since we shared the VOCC audit program's industry best practices. Additionally, all but two carriers have internal documentation. We are in regular communication with them and to understand the timeline for completion of these activities. Next slide. Um, so in addition to uh, documentation, the audit has tracked quantitative data on detention and demerge quarterly. The most recent quarterly data submission was due on May 16th, so our, our discussion today um, will really go up to quarter four of 2021. Um, so you have in your, uh, next slide please, in your um, uh, materials a, a chart that looks like this, which is easier to see when you're looking at it as opposed to a PowerPoint. Uh, so I'll turn your attention to the detention and demerge indices chart. So the total detention and demerge billed by the top nine carriers increased substantially between quarter three and quarter four of 2021, with the amount collected exceeding $1 billion in the fourth quarter for the nine carriers combined. The number of loaded TEUs moved was flat over the past few quarters due to congestion. The extreme congestion of quarter four in 2021 is reflected in the high revenues of detention and demerge. We know this congestion has contributed to detention and demerge billings as containers have sat on docks for longer periods and street dwell time has increased. Next slide, please. In the aggregate for calendar year of 2021, we see detention and demerge collected is at $4 billion. And we know that a large portion of this was collected in the second half of the calendar year as congestion was at a peak for all entities on the supply chain. So from this slide, you can see total detention and demerge build was $5.3 billion, collected was $4 billion, and waived was $646.7 million. I am concerned by the extent to which deter de detention and demerge collected has risen faster than waivers or refunds. I also want to say that as we look at these numbers, we know that not every carrier tracks waivers and refunds the same way, so these data aren't perfect measures, but we must also keep in mind that carriers are carrying record-setting volumes into the United States. Our entire supply chain is operating at the limits of its capabilities and the maximum of its capacity, and for better or for worse, detention and demerge is going to be implicated very quickly. The audit team and I will probe these numbers in that context. But this data will be a good reference point as we evaluate the quarter one 2022 data in the next few weeks and identify areas of focus for additional conversations on the divergence between the rate of growth of detention and demerge collected versus waived. Next slide, please. Turning to smaller carriers, towards the end of 2021, we started evaluating the public facing documentation that smaller carriers have related to detention and demerge in light of the best practices that we identified and shared with the larger carriers last fall. We reached out to the smaller carriers who carried substantial amounts of cargo in the east-west trades to discuss where they, there were missing components to their websites, such as lack of, of contact information or detention and demerge, um, billing disputes, things like that. Next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry, I, sh I should have said, we're pleased to note, this is important, that nearly all carriers that we sent correspondence to and had meetings with are now in compliance with our uh, FMC um, industry best practices. So that's a good report. And now, now I'll turn to the brand new work of the team to evaluate exports. Next slide, please. 
In March, Chairman Maffei requested that the team expand our scope to examine how shipping lines are serving U.S. exporters. The team wanted these discussions to be data-driven, so we used peers data to identify trends and exports for each carrier by both broad commodity group and port of loading from 2019 to 2021. We developed a set of questions for the carriers related to the reason for the trends, whether they have an export strategy, challenges faced in moving certain commodities, especially agricultural commodities, and we asked for feedback about issues maybe the FMC was overlooking or additional areas of focus. Next slide, please. Um, we will discuss some of the responses in more detail in the closed session today, but some general themes emerge. Most carriers were able to articulate strategies for serving exports, and a subset of carriers have very sophisticated and well-established strategies for their export programs. Multiple carriers discussed non-pandemic shocks that affected exports driven by many changes in country policies. An example of that would be waste paper or scrap in China. It is definitely the case that economics and business models involved in moving exports are complex. It is not simply a matter of taking a box and filling it and moving it. Often, the location of the empties are not where the export loads are, and the types of equipment needed varies. Despite the complexity involved in exporting, it is critical to the shipping public that U.S. exporters are served by carriers. We will discuss more in depth in the closed session some options for following up on this work. Next slide. Before I end our open session together, um, I want to express my appreciation to the carriers who are working with us on this uh, VOCC audit program. We commend their timeliness with getting data to us. They're open to adopting the suggestions that we give them. Um, really, we, we have open lines of communication, and, and we really appreciate that. I think that our conversations are mutually beneficial, and uh, we are all, we're all benefiting from our, from our time together. So uh, thank you again for the opportunity to brief you today in the open session. Thank you, Ms. Marvin. Yes. I'll now uh, recognize my colleagues for questions about your presentation. Commissioner Dye. Uh, thank you very much for that. I'm a huge proponent of, of this new program of ours, um, and I'm pleased to hear that you believe that it's working. Yes. Do you believe that our industry partners um, and our shippers understand how the interpretative rule shifted the risk for demurrage and detention. Do you think that they understand the changes um, for charges and who is responsible for charges under certain under certain conditions? I appreciate that question, Commissioner Dai. Thank you. Um, I I think that uh, if they don't already understand, we're certainly getting there, and a. Um, uh, uh, one of our, our key focuses earlier in the audit was to ensure that we had discussions with each of the carriers about the interpretive rule, which I want to say was very helpful. Um, I think they found it very informative, and I don't think that they fully appreciated these points that you're talking about. So those kinds of efforts are very worthwhile, and um, I, I think uh, that that is, you know, still on our to-do list is to make sure that we do outreach to every corner of this industry, not just the carriers and the audit program. There's, there are a lot more out there. There's a lot more work to do on that front, and, and we do intend to do that. So thank you for that question. Yeah, I, I appreciate it because I, I, I still hear uh, complaints um, that are based on fault. Understood. Um, and it's uh, not that. Right. Our experience was that discussions of fault lead you right down a rabbit hole. Yes. And um, so I, I appreciate it. And um, um, with my colleagues' support, I hope that we can get um, um, industry compliance officers in place for you. Thank you. Um, to provide an even greater support yes. um, for your work. 
That so would thank be, you. Thank you. That would be great. Appreciate that. Thank you, Commissioner Dye. Commissioner Benzel. Um, the stun those stunning figures. They are. Uh, that's a lot of money. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm going to keep most of, uh, of my comments in, in, in internal because of the nature of what we're discussing. But the, I talked to the chairman previously about this export issues, and you look at the st statistics on uh, imports uh, continuing to uh, to to increase, and then uh, exports flat or or below, uh, de declining. And so we need to really drill down on that. And I know we did that later in the process because uh, the tension to merge was further along. But uh, I think we really need to look uh, closely uh, at uh, what's going on in those those markets. And so I'm glad we're collecting information. I also think that it's probably uh, would be helpful to get uh, some uh, assistance from the Department of Agriculture mm -hmm. uh, on the, the, this is an issue of whether or not a decline of uh, export uh, mm -hmm. uh, is is unreasonable. And so a lot of that does go into the character of the movement. So if it needs to be uh, fumigated or other elements that we need to consider in terms of, uh, of reasonable this, but uh, but we're we're going to be focused uh, on this issue for a long time. So we need to uh, start to think about those uh, those elements. Um, but uh, I'll keep most of my questions to internal uh, okay. discussions. All right. So I look forward thank, to those, Commissioner Benzel. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Benzel. Commissioner Sola. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to say thank you for um, uh, putting forward this initiative and directing staff to develop this program. Uh, it definitely appears to be working. I believe the outreach and the collaboration that you're receiving uh, from the carriers is, is probably unprecedented, I would say. Yeah. Um, I'm going to reserve the majority of my comments for the closed session, uh, okay. but I will say in the open session that um, I, I do have a problem ethically mm -hmm. with charging for an export container that is dropped off at the port and it's not being able to get on a ship in time and then they're and then they're given a bill. So um, exports are definitely part of uh, my main concern. Understood. Thank you, Commissioner Sola. Thank you, Commissioner Sola. I, I feel the same way on the export container issue. Uh, Commissioner Beckage. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Commissioner Sola and Mr. Benzel and I, uh, most of my work in the private sector was with uh, agricultural exports, and so it's near and dear to my heart um, that we figure it out on how to better um, providers of the service and ensure that uh, the equipment's there. So I'm uh, excited about your uh, and the agency looking and uh, and doing more, and uh, I certainly know. Uh, uh, for my confirmation hearings, there's an appetite from Congress, mm -hmm. um, but they're looking for answers from this agency and people we talk to. And I'm uh, so I'm excited that uh, that we're uh, putting resources and uh, uh, brain power into this, and I'm looking forward to to seeing uh, positive results. And and uh, again, as from the outside, I have uh, worked with the Department of Agriculture before, and they. On agricultural exports, and they were they were very helpful, and um, and I think we ought to tap uh, tap all we can, everybody we can, to enlist their help and uh, and getting behind an FMC led effort on exports. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Beckage. Thank you, Commissioner Beckage. Um, uh, well, for my part, I'm real. I am having a lot of trouble getting my head around this uh, this graph. Um, obviously over one and a half billion dollars in detention and demerge does seem pretty stark. On the other hand, I think it's important to per point out that there's a good reason why uh, there is such a, of course, there's a lot of legitimate detention and demerge out there. And, and were, you, were we to uh, ban or suspend detention and demerge, first of all, I don't think we have that uh, authority, but uh, were, were we to get that authority and to do it, um, we would be uh, asking for extraordinarily more congestion because, of course, these charges, when legitimate, do help move cargo. 
That said, though, it's, it is very difficult to figure out, uh, you know, we just don't have the data. As you've mentioned, our day, even the data we do have is it's to be taken with a bit of a grain of salt because different carriers measure things in different ways. Uh, but we don't really know here what's legitimate and what's not. And even the measure of, of wave charges can be for several things. So I don't know, maybe it's not possible, but one thing I would request that you do is get together with Dr. Monaco and her staff and see if we can overlay at least some sort of a measure of congestion itself, right? I mean, are the are the D&D charges increasing relative to congestion? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, as congestion's increasing, if, if you know, and, and my guess is there's a lag, there's a lag, so, you know, congestion might increase right. a quarter and then, right. but, uh, but I would be curious to know that and, you know, and if there is any anything else we can ask the carriers or, to help us, uh, you know, dive deeper into this. I mean, it's also, of course, notable that roughly uh, um, half a billion dollars is not collected, or at least not collected on this chart. And what does that mean? It's not waived. Some of it is waived, but but a good deal of it is not waived and yet not collected. So right. curious as to where that where that's going. Um, uh, so you know, obviously, the exporting issue is the the thing that's on you know, a lot of the commissioner's minds, and uh, we have to talk to you about anything specific in, in, uh, in the uh, executive session. But I do want to ask, uh, can you make any general observations that you can share in open session, uh, just generally speaking about the uh, export, uh, whether we're making progress or that sort of thing, and the openness of the industry generally to um, looking at uh, changing export uh, uh, carriage processes? Um, I, I think the, the the team would agree with me. Uh, we were, oh, I'm sorry. Can you, can, can you hear me? Can all of you hear me? Okay, okay. Okay, great. Um, I, uh, in our discussions with carriers, we were, um, um, I think the, I was impressed by how open they were about discussing their export programs with us. Again, um, over half of them have export policies and export programs, and uh, a couple of them, of course, I can't name names, but you know that is, is a, it's a major focus for them, and they they call themselves the export carrier. That is something that they um, they try to ensure that they 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 take whatever exports are are thrown their way and get them out. Um, I, I think that there is some work to do with others. Um, you know, I think that we, we've we discussed in, in um, some of our previous sessions here today that, uh, um, you know, the location of the exports, the location of the equipment, the lo none of this stuff is always in sync with each other. And I think that this is going to be a challenge that we have. Um, ongoing, and I think it's something that that uh, the VOCC audit program, in more discussions with the carriers um, and other industry participants, need to tease out uh, what what is the uh, you know kind of the the, the coming together um, of of all of these factors, um, the costs that go into getting exports. Uh, that was a, a theme that came up often in our conversations. Um, I think that, uh, again, these are issues that, um, you know, we're, we've taken your directive seriously, Mr. Chairman, and, and we will continue to get more information on those. Commissioner Dye. Uh, yes, just to add, uh, to add one point, um, this um, <laughs> ridiculous situation um, where an exporter may be charged uh, demurrage when a ship has not yet arrived mm -hmm. in port. Um, uh, most carriers told me they don't, they don't do that anymore. Okay. So uh, I am hopeful um, that as we look more closely mm -hmm. uh, at their worst problem, which involves the earliest return date, yeah. uh, we can work together right, and uh, get some and, and drive some change in that area. Yes. I, I Thank agree. You. Thank you. And if I may, just to throw into that mix, the, there's the issue of fall downs. There is the issue of, of you know, overbooking, of no shows, of canceled sailings. There's there are so many uh, factors that that um, I think are, ex are 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 impacting our exporters um, that we need to continue to look at mm -hmm. in this I, audit. I agree. Yeah. 
Thank you, Commissioner Dye, and uh, thank you, uh, Managing Director Marvin. Yeah, I think it was um, uh, Lloyd's List uh, Richard editor Richard Mead who described the industry, um, and it was a different regulatory context, but still it fits with this as a, a group of the good, the bad, and the minimally compliant. Um, and uh, I think that's sort of what we're what we're starting to see. Um, but uh, in any event, uh, as as we. We've all mentioned uh, some of this has to be uh, discussed, unfortunately, yeah. and not in public session. So we'll get more to that. Okay. Appreciate your work. Uh, appreciate the work of your audit team, um, particularly given that uh, everything else that you you have responsibilities for is, is really really remarkable. Uh, I you know I, I wish we had better data, but certainly. Uh, the anecdotal reports that we get are it is doing a lot of good, yeah. um, and uh, we'll continue to, uh, uh, to to look for that and support it. Um, with that, uh, any of my colleagues have anything else to say in the public session? Commissioner Benzel. Yeah, I just wanted to commend you for, uh, I know we we can't reveal all, all of the information that we're going to uh, get briefed on, but uh, I think it's important to, to make it uh, publicly uh, known that we're, we're taking steps affirmatively to, to do this, and we can provide the, the public some information about it. And so I'm glad yes. this was uh, open and, and, and they know we're looking at this. And, and that's sometimes as advantageous as any action that we can take legally is just the fact that we're looking at it. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Benzel. Anyone else for the good of the order? Okay. Um, so uh, uh, that will be the last item in our public session today. I would like to take a brief 10-minute break. So we'll be convened at 11.45 to do the uh, closed session. Um, this, this meeting showcased some of the incredible work being done at the Federal Maritime Commission by our uh, small yet dedicated and robust staff. I thank each and every one of the employees at this agency for the dedication um, and professionalism and flexibility. And I look forward to sharing more of their great work with the public at future commission meetings, which hopefully can remain in person. Thank you very much. And we'll now break for a, a brief uh, 10 minute recess.